Morning, everybody. Great to kick it off. So hopefully I can keep you all awake. You know, I know it's tough to start in the morning. Have a quick little talk here. You know, I've been doing security forever. You know, I try to think of something to talk about. So I decided, let's talk a little about IoT because, you know, IoT is out there now. We're connecting everything. We're making so many things connected, but it's turning into this security train wreck that's out there. So I figured I'd start off and give you some things to think about, you know, keep it entertaining. But, you know, start off the day, give you something interesting. Give an idea of what am I talk about today. I'm going to set the stage, you know, what IoT is, you know, Internet of Things. What am I talking about? So everybody's on the same page. We're going to go through, talk about some of the security implications. It's starting to keep snowballing as we go. And then we'll talk a little bit about averting when I would say disaster, because I see a major train wreck in the IoT space because we're deploying thousands and thousands and thousands of different devices. There's no thinking on security. So it's allowing interesting things to happen from a security perspective. So let's talk about this connection craze I'm talking about, setting up Internet of Things, how we're connecting everything to everything else, so that we can do things more efficiently. If you think about it, we started with our computers and our phones. Made sense, you know, my phone's connected, my computer's connected, I can reach out, I can get information. Then we started expanding it. We went and did, you know, the cameras. Originally, you had cameras. They could take digital pictures. You put on an SD card, connect that to your computer, upload your pictures. Not very efficient. So we started making the cameras have own Wi-Fi so I can connect them directly. They even made SD cards with Wi-Fi so you can do it from the SD card. Then we expanded it. We added cars. We have a nice cars that tuck to the cellular network now. We have our luggage. You know, for when you're traveling worldwide and your luggage doesn't follow you, you can figure out where your luggage went. Eh, that's too, you could believe that. Then we went to the appliances in your house. We have refrigerators, stoves, crock pots, some other things in the house like mattresses and toilets. I'm not quite sure why they need to be connected to the network, but they have them. You have your traditional ones, you know, your smart TVs, your locks, your light bulbs, if you will, thermostats. Everything's getting connected. We have our personal assistants now like Alexis and Echo. Everything's being connected to everything else. We even have, you can get shoes that are connected. Basketballs now, soccer balls. They're putting electronics into athletic balls so that they can measure the velocity, what it's happening, so they can make more statistics for games. Everything is being connected. We even have a Bluetooth-enabled fork so they can actually monitor your eating. It, everything's getting connected. And obviously, you know, everything being connected, nothing would ever happen from a security perspective. No, no problem at all. In fact, if you go listen to Gardner, Gardner's report says in about, you know, 2020, not that many years away, there's going to be over 20 billion connected devices. In fact, this is the first year we actually, the number of connected devices actually exceeded the population of the planet. There's only a little over 7 billion people, and there was like 8.6 billion connected devices this year. So there's a lot of devices out there. So what's the security implications of this? One of the things you start seeing is, how many people remember last October, the Mirai botnet? Massive DDoS attack against Dyn. Basically had impacts on Netflix, Google, lots of different companies that use Dyn. And this attack was done by a lot of devices that were compromised. There were DVRs, cameras, all of these connected devices that had simple to exploit security vulnerabilities. There's other ones as well. Just a few weeks ago, almost, you know, a lot of people hear about Airbnb where you can go and rent somebody else's house when you go on vacation somewhere. Well, they have electronic locks because it's very easy to Set it up, give someone a code, let them get in the house. You can monitor when people are coming and going. Well, the company that produced one of the major locks used by most of the Airbnb providers, the vendor themselves messed up their firmware update. They basically effectively made those devices, those locks now, could no longer communicate with their server. They couldn't update their logs. They couldn't change anything. We've seen a couple of years ago, how many people remember Charlie Miller did his attack against a Cher Jeep Cherokee, he was able to take control of a car and drive it into the ditch. I mean, he actually worked with a reporter who knew he was going to do this, and the reporter was still terrified. And then just recently, 
someone else figured out instead of trying to actually take control of a car and actually change the way it's going, they could DOS the components of the car itself. So think your airbag in your car. They could make basically make the car think the airbag was malfunctioning and now it would no longer operate. So now your car, if you get into a wreck, wouldn't have an airbag anymore. All these attacks are happening. They've attacked medical devices. They've attacked baby monitors. In fact, just think about a year ago, there was a toy bear that got outlawed in Germany because of privacy concerns, because it was connected to the internet and it could leak information about the child, which was protected information. So there's all kinds of attacks that are coming on. In fact, what do the experts say? If you go to Rob Joyce, you know, head of NSA's Trusted Access Operations Group, he was speaking in 2016 at the Enigma conference, and he specifically called out IoT as another one of those vectors you could use to target and get into a network. In fact, one of the things he mentioned specifically was heating and cooling systems, where I could attack the thermostat as a way to get into the network. I mean, people that watch, like Mr. Robot, they actually did an attack where they attacked a thermostat and used it to raise the temperature of a building and destroy some data. But those attacks could potentially be real. That was on TV. But we have a team of researchers that part of our guys look for zero days. They found some zero days in a train thermostat. <clears throat> we contacted train, you know, responsibly disclosed that. One of the challenges they had, they could no longer even build the firmware for that thermostat. So it took them about two years before they could actually patch these bugs. Significant period of time. What are some of the bugs we're talking about? Things you think of in computers five, ten years ago. We're repeating the same process in IoT now. Hard-coded credentials, buffer overflows. These devices are small computers, but they don't have all the protections. They don't have ASLR. They don't have depth. They're just pretty much Brand new, like we were thinking of computers five and ten years ago. It's going to be a challenge to protect these and secure these. And the other side is these vendors aren't thinking about security. In this case, after they actually patched it, you think, you know, in a computer, if you patch a vulnerability, what are you going to have? You're going to have an advisory. Someone's going to say, my software had a security vulnerability, and it's been patched. In this case, no advisory. They never made anything. All they actually did was put a new update on their server, if you will, on their web server out on the web. If you're a home user and you have a thermostat and it's working, your house is cooling, your house is heating, are you going to download a firmware update that could potentially brick your thermostat? You're not likely to do it unless you have a reason. There was no indication here that they're doing anything like, why would I put this update out there? There was no indication there's, well, you need to update because there's a security issue. In fact, we went through after they did the update, and we're like, well, let's see if we can even find any indication that they actually updated the bugs we actually did. We know it was fixed, but let's see if there's any indication. So we grabbed the tarball, started looking in it. There's a bunch of different files in this tarball, so we looked, and... There's a small text file in there. So, we, okay, let's look in that text file. We dig in that text file. Oh, sure enough, there's a single line that talks about, oh, there's some security fixes by Talos. That's the only indication that you should update your firmware to address these bugs, even though someone can literally take control of your thermostat because of the security concerns involved. That's a challenge that we're going to have going forward. Cameras are another one. We deploy cameras everywhere to monitor everything from people running through red lights, you know, securing our areas, securing our homes, but we're constantly finding more issues in these cameras. We just recently in June found another 20 zero days in the FOSCAM cameras. <clears throat> they actually fixed them. We up, you know, sent out our updates. But one of the things that's interesting is we think about like best practices with cameras and most of these updates, a lot more firmware updates, not something easy to do. I remember back in the while back when people would have to update their BIOS on the computer. No one wanted to do that because you could break your computer. Well, in this case, they don't want you to update the firmware either. In fact, we found a camera vendor, and one of the things that they actually said was, don't update the firmware if your camera is working. If it's working fine, you could break it. 
So they're actually encouraging people not to update their firmware. And that's one of the challenges. Either people don't have any clue to update it, or they don't even know something is connected. I mean, people don't know my light bulb is now connected to the internet. Can someone connect to it? Can someone get it to do something it's not supposed to be doing? So how do we avert this craziness that I'm talking about? I mean, I've mentioned, you know, people aren't thinking about patching. We have trouble in enterprise space with computers to do patching, much less when you have all these devices. Like if you get a soccer ball that's got Wi-Fi capability, are you going to think to update the firmware on it? How would you even connect to it? I mean, it, it gets challenging. You're not thinking about updating your refrigerator. The advisories, we don't have advisories. They don't have any kind of mechanism currently. Most of them don't even annotate when they're doing an update. They just come out with new versions of software. A lot of these updates are firmware fixes, like I said. Nobody wants to do a firmware fix because there's a chance you can actually physically make the box never work again. These are challenges that are going to be difficult to go overcome. We don't have ASLR. We don't have DEP. We don't have the traditional protections we have on a computer. Yet the devices are multiplying at a phenomenal rate. So what are some of the stuff that we can do? We need to put pressure on these guys to start thinking about security. I mean, right now, everybody's, oh, cool, this is connected. I can do this great functionality. I can, you know, buy a doorbell now where I can see who's at my door, even if I'm miles away from my house. Great functionality, but it also has to be secure. What if someone breaks into it and uses it for something else? Or even if it's a simple device like they did with the DVRs, they could do a massive DDoS attack against the Dyn network and make major implications of what's happening. So we can't just blindly deploy all this. We've got to think about it from a security perspective and let people know that, hey, I'm not going to just deploy your product unless you actually think about security first. And in fact, we need to segment things off. I mean, that's one of the things we've seen, like with the WannaCry and the Nyetnya attacks. The more segmented your network is, the more chance you have at least of Limiting the scope, if something is insecure, how can you prevent that spread? So, I mean, where are we going to end up? You know, I like to think we're going to work as a community. We're going to put pressure on these guys to say, okay, give us secure IoT devices and everything's going to be great. You know, crisis averted. You know, it won't be perfect. It'll be like now. We keep finding more issues, but no real major catastrophe. Or... The other side, is it going to be like it's going now where things just keep failing? And the problem here is when these things fail, there's ser you know, serious implications. I mean, we're talking about the cars. Would you like it if someone could take over your car and start driving you wherever they want it without you being able to do anything about it? Those are serious things. You don't want that to fail. So just something to think about. So I figured I'd start out the day and just get you all thinking about something that's really interesting out there that's going to impact all of us because we keep adding more and more things that keep getting connected. So hopefully, you know, this was an interesting talk, something, you know, give you a think about, start on the morning. I like to talk with all of you. I'm going to be hanging around most of the two days now. So if you see me, you know, come by and talk. We'll just have a chat on what's going on. You know, if you have great skills, hey, come see us as well. We're always hiring new people as part of Talos. So, hey, we'd like to talk to you and see what you do. But overall, have a great conference, and I will turn it back over to our MC now. Thank you very much, Earl.